It's my pleasure to introduce Kim French, who um, is the executive director of the Suburban Lung Associate. Kim is extremely knowledgeable, and I always ask a question, so she's going to educate us on ICU and plural procedures. Great. Thank you so much. Fantastic uh, presentations thus far. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, Interventional pulmonary specialists are really a hybrid, meaning you cross over several specialty and subspecialty areas, so you really have to keep in mind what are the pulmonary rules, what are the critical care rules, and what are the IP rules. And then if some of you do sleep medicine, you have really a fourth area of specialty um, to, to maintain knowledge and correct coding on. So we're going to talk about uh, critical care, plural procedures, and how those meld together. Just a few quick disclosures. I am on the board of the CHEST Foundation, which is the philanthropic arm of CHEST. And if you're unfamiliar with what we do, I'd be happy to talk with you after the session. Chair of the Patient Education Work Group. I'm on the steering committee of the Practice Operations Network at CHEST and the Women's Advisory Council at our local ALA in Chicago. So I work with three gentlemen here in the audience, and this is probably what they think of me on most days. <laughs> so know before you code. These are just some quick reminders uh, which are easy to forget, but you need to follow these if you really want your claim to be appropriately coded and appropriately paid. So document accurately. Documentation should reflect the level of work done and code to that level. You know, it's really important whether you're just starting out or you're seasoned to review your documentation, especially now that it's all EHR, even in the Bronx suite. It's easy to get sloppy and miss salient points that are going to be audited, so you should prepare for that. Code every visit as you will be audited. This will happen. Medicare has told us right up front they're going to audit you. It's just a matter of time uh, when your tax ID number may come up. Certainly consults, critical care, and procedures are low-hanging fruit in the eyes of Medicare and um, contract auditors, so you should prepare for that. Be thorough, not greedy. I think the consult during bronchoscopy is a perfect example of that. Do it when it's appropriate. Don't do it every time, or you will certainly flag an audit. Reimbursement is largely dependent on the payer, and we heard a lot about that tonight. There's lots of carrier differences and geographical differences, and you should know what is appropriate in your area. Be aware of local carrier differences. We talked about that. We can't discuss specific fee schedules outside of your area. The government um, frowns upon that. Fees typically are set to capture all three level of code components. So a global fee is both the professional and technical component together. The technical component is typically what the facility will be paid. And you are the professional component, typically what the physician will be paid. Document, document, document. Correct coding initiatives. So we talked a lot about bundling earlier, I think, in both presentations. The correct coding initiative is basically the way the government structured codes and code sets to tell us what can be billed together, what can't be billed together, and when you need a modifier. You can look this up uh, as the correct coding initiative on the web, and they give you hundreds and hundreds of sets of code pairs. Some can be used together and some cannot. So it's a very long definition of bundling. Critical care is defined by CPT, which is um, you should own it. If your office doesn't own the CPT manual, you should make sure every year it's updated. It's how the AMA communicates to us as providers what the new codes are, what has been modified, and what the deleted codes are. And it's important to stay on top of that. So let's talk about critical care. It's important to point out here that critical care is the direct delivery by a physician or other qualified healthcare professional, and we'll talk about who that could be, of medical care to the critically ill patient or critically injured patient. Critical illness or injury acutely impairs one or more vo vital organ systems, thereby creating a high probability of a life-threatening condition. 
Critical care involves high complexity of medical decision making. That is the most important sentence in the entire description, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Here's the CPT codes for critical care. I don't know if there's any pediatric intensivists in the audience or those who practice pediatric critical care, but there are two new sets of codes that came out within the last couple of years, which you can familiarize you or your hospital teams with. Adult critical care, which is what we'll focus on tonight, is 99291 and 99292, and there are specific coding rules for those. And then remote video, which is basically um, you know, your remote ICU care, lots of different brands out there. Uh, and those are tracking or category three codes at this point. Um, so tele-ICU is being tracked. I don't know whether it'll be reimbursed at some future point in time. I think there are a few places that do reimburse at the carrier level for it, but most tele-ICU is contracted. So calculation of critical care time is critical. Critical care time is calculated on a calendar day and can be documented in two ways, as running total time or total time spent with the patient on unit or floor. Okay, and that, that's deceiving and, and I'll talk a little bit about why, where the misnomers are. Time may be calculated, at, whoops, as I said, uh, in, in total time or elapsed time, okay, if the patient meets the critically ill definition. So how do you calculate it? It's not a location. It's a level of service. So you can provide critical care outside of the critical care unit and still bill critical care. You can bill critical care in the emergency department, on the floor, in your office, if the patient meets those guidelines. This is important to keep in mind, and we'll talk about carrier differences uh, when calculating your time, okay? 99291, which is your first 30 minutes in a calendar day of critical care billing, that has to be met by one individual provider on that calendar day in order to start the critical care clock. So if you're providing critical care to a critically ill patient and you have 17 minutes and your partner comes in and they have 20 minutes and then the next person has 35 minutes that's not critical care that's not going to qualify on the first person of the day for critical care billing that first provider even if you're the same tax ID has to be 30 minutes or greater Okay, so that, a lot of people don't understand that, but that is the critical care ruling, and if you are audited, they're gonna be looking for that first 30-minute increment on the calendar day. Now, subsequently, if your first partner has met that 30-minute time frame, your other, either you or another person from your, from your tax ID group can add, be additive into those times. Then, uh, thus using the 99292, okay? And those increments, it's the same code, it's just the next 30 minutes. So the first set of critical care coding would be 30 to 74 minutes for a 99291, and then 99292 is basically, as you can see, 30 minute increments from that point forward. Now, in Illinois, almost every carrier has said, we're going to give you in a, in a calendar day one 99291 and one 99292 as a maximum. I don't know if other folks are seeing that. Uh, it's been very challenging in Illinois to get the, the multiple increments of, of critical care beyond two. So critical care coding considerations, ICD-10, use the diagnosis that supports medical necessity. We've talked a lot about medical necessity here tonight. It's important with these new codes hot off the press that you familiarize yourself with ICD-10. ICD-9 may have had one code for septic shock. ICD-10 has six. So, you know, acute respiratory failure. A lot of the things that you will be using in critical care now have multiple codes, and they're each a little bit different. 
Um, if you are using the new ICD-10 codes, which you all should be, and I'm sure you are, please familiarize yourself with your options and don't just default to maybe what you used to do in ICD-9. You may find yourself not getting paid. Use modifier 25 on critical care when you are performing other procedural services on the same calendar day. Okay, so if you're doing critical care and appropriately billable procedures, you'll need to append that 99291 or 99292 with a 25 modifier telling the carrier it's distinctly separate from what I'm doing procedurally. So that's important. Critical care within the same group all performed by physicians on the same calendar day should be accumulated and billed as the sum total under the first physician of the day meeting that 30 minute increment. So first physician of the day bills the critical care time for the entire calendar day for all your partners in the same tax ID. Okay, you don't all bill your 30 minute increment separately. If you have nurse practitioners or PAs, um, the, the nomenclature is non-physician provider or NPP and it encompasses nurse practitioners, PAs, and some clin clinical nurse specialists. They are able to bill critical care uh, under the Nurse Practice Act and under the Physician Delegation Act in most states. Now your hospital bylaws may have varying um, positions on this. Our hospitals allow nurse practitioners and PAs to build critical care. What you can't do is mix and match, which I talk about right there. So physician number one has 30 minute increment. The NP comes in and does 37 minutes and then somebody goes back and the physician has another 40 minutes later in the day, that time cannot be accumulated because Medicare says it's two different levels of providers, so we can't pay you the same because as you know, when a mid-level provider or an NPP is billing Medicare, it's 80% of the physician fee schedule when they are billing independently. And for critical care, there is no shared split ruling. So you can't share that time with your nurse practitioner or your PA. It's always exclusive of procedure time and when you're documenting critical care, you should make sure that your documentation reflects that by having a standing um, sentence or something built into your, no your critical care note saying exclusive of any procedure time performed. And it must not overlap any other physician or NPP at the same time. So if you're billing critical care and maybe a cardiologist is billing critical care or a neurosurgeon, you cannot be performing critical care at the same 30 minute juncture as those other physicians. And under audit, your time will matter. So you have to be careful not to overlap. Correct coding initiative, services included in critical care. These are things you cannot bill separately, okay? Interpretation of cardiac output, and I have the CPT codes there for you. Review of chest x-rays, any oximetry, blood gases, gastric intubation, vent management, and vascular access. This is probably the one that people get most confused about when you can bill certain lines and when you can't. Important principle of critical care, the bottom line is no time, no money. Okay, if you have critical care billing and you have not recorded your time, the auditor, Medicare, the carrier will not look beyond that. The very first thing they look at in your note is your time. So you have to make sure you're documenting critical care time as either an elapsed time or a total time, okay? Without the time, they don't care what you did, they're not even gonna look at that note. They're gonna probably downcode you to some very low level e &M code. Common critical care and plural procedures. So common procedures in critical care that are billable. Now remember, if you're doing these on the same calendar day as your critical care coding time, you have to append a 25 modifier to that 99291 or 99292. 
I won't read all of these. I think most of you know what they are. I'm giving you the codes in case you're unfamiliar with them. You can ask questions at the end if you have questions about any of these uh, procedures, intubation, uh, tube change when a fistula tract is not developed. It's, it's not somebody that's had a trach for months and months and months. Um, bedside trachs, therapeutic aspiration, which we heard a little bit earlier. Um, chest tube open, removal of tunneled catheter, thoracentesis, insertion of CVP, and replacement of CVP over a wire. Okay, one thing to point out on this chest tube open, this is um, what Medicare has said as probably what most people in this room think of your traditional chest tube insertion. Okay, there are a couple other new chest tube catheter codes um, which don't fall into that category. So be careful about with your folks that do your billing and then you as your document as you're documenting, make sure you're using the right chest tube or catheter codes. Um, more of these codes, billable, again, these all need a 25 modifier on your E&M or your critical care, replacement of a PIC line, repositioning of CVP under, pleuro, under fluoro, hemodialysis catheter, PEG placement, paracentesis with and without imaging is billable, lumbar puncture, right heart cath, swan gans, and surfactant administration through endotracheal tube. I don't know how many folks do that, but it is billable. Common guidance codes. This gets very confusing. Um, be careful if you're using ultrasound fluoro or CT when you can bill it and when you can't. There's, there's um, some codes, and I think this, this is recorded so you can always get it on the website, but there is a, a code for chest scan only. I don't know how many people know that. If you're just gonna scan the chest and you end up not doing a procedure, you can bill that. Uh, vascular access, most folks are, are doing these things. Uh, CT guidance, um, some of the fluoro codes. Depends on if you're doing it yourself or you're, you have um, you know, radiology uh, performing that. Echo, newer codes, one's with a color flow Doppler and one is without, but that is also billable. So you should make sure if you're practicing critical care, um, whether consistently or inconsistently, it, how much you're practicing, you should be sure you're capturing these guidance codes when you can. A lot of times this is the thing that sort of falls to the bottom of the claim, the bottom of your mental pile throughout the day, and, and you sort of um, skim over the fact that you could have billed for some of the imaging codes. Plural procedures, lots of them. Um, most of you are probably practicing these both as pulmonary critical care and IP. So indwelling pleural catheter, chest tube open, remember that's the other, that's the, the traditional chest tube. Removal of indwelling pleural catheter, placement of interstitial device for radiation therapy, thoracentesis with and without imaging. Remember last year this code changed and so there's no longer a time when you put your ultrasound separately. You're either doing it with imaging or doing it without. In the old days, it used to be with the kit or without, you know, with the catheter or without. Now they just assume everyone's doing it with the catheter. More plural codes, plural drainage, percutaneous with insertion of indwelling catheter without imaging, and then with imaging. Chemical pleuridesis includes thoracentesis, but not the chest tube. So remember, you have to build the 32551 chest tube open in addition to your pleuridesis. A lot of people forget that. Uh, fibrinalysis is on here as um, subsequent and, and uh, initial and subsequent, and then percutaneous pleural biopsy. Thoracoscopy, thoracoscopy codes, a lot of interventional pulmonologists uh, practice these, and this is also a confusing area when you're using these codes, which level of th uh, thoracoscopy you should be doing. I put together the entire gamut of probably what most of you would bill for thoracoscopy, diagnostic, pericardial sac, mediastinal, diagnostic with lung biopsies, uh, 
lung uh, biopsy of a nodular mass with wedge, pleura, surgical pleuridesis, another common area, and uh, partial pulmonary decortication. Multiple procedure rule, which you heard about earlier, does apply. And then this is just a quick slide on really what the multiple procedure rule, multiple endoscopy rule, pardon me, covers. So multiple procedures other than bronchoscopy in a same setting that fall outside of those CCI edits. Those CCI edits were code pairs that are acceptable and unacceptable, and we talked about that earlier. So full payment is made for the procedure with the highest practice expense, hence putting your highest level CPT code on your claim first and then working your way down. For subsequent procedures, same patient, same day, full payment is made for work and malpractice and 80% payment for the practice expense for that service furnished in office setting or other non-facility setting. Okay, and then that's paid at 75% of those practice expenses furnished in a facility setting. So this is a lot of jargon, but it basically tells you how they're going to reduce your payment, okay, either under multiple endoscopy or multiple procedure rule. You can use a 51 modifier for multiple procedures, and it may be carrier dependent. This is different than a 59 modifier, which we heard about in the last two sessions, okay? A 51 modifier tells the carrier, I did two procedures that may or may not be billable together, but I did them for distinct reasons. Here's one diagnosis of why I did this procedure. Here's another diagnosis of why I did another procedure, which sometimes may have been bundled, but you're telling the carrier it shouldn't be bundled in this particular setting. Uh, global period, real quickly, um, so your, your base diagnostic thoracoscopies don't have a global, your surgical thoracoscopies do have a global, and what do you need to know about global billing? You can't bill a related e &M service within that period. Common modifiers, talked about those earlier. I think the only uh, different one here is bilateral procedure. Be careful, this is not for procedures that are typically done in a bilateral setting, it's when you have to do it bilaterally. And wrapping up, reminding you to order your uh, new Coding for Chest Medicine book, which I believe is on the Chest uh, bookstore. Thank you, questions, email me. <laughs> general question, sorry, is there a code for tracheostomy tube change in an outpatient bronchoscopy or procedure center? There's the one code which is um, trach change before the fistula tract. No, there is but no there's, code. So there's nothing right. for a mature tract. So then no. what do you bill yeah. then in that? In that? You do it in e &M. Yeah, it's an E&M visit. It would be bundled into your E&M. So then does the procedure suite not get paid? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Are you doing outpatient hospital? You mentioned before that, uh, or somebody mentioned that uh, conscious or moderate, sorry, you, somebody mentioned before that conscious or moderate sedation is bundled with bronchoscopy. For pleurex catheters or pleural biopsies, can you also bill procedural sedation separately from those procedures? No. No. All of your, all of your endoscopy type procedures currently have moderate sedation included. Thanks again. I'll be around, so if you have questions. Thank you so much, Kim. One quick comment. You notice the fibrinolysis code? That's actually a code when you put TPA and DNA for empyema. If you're not doing this, you should be doing it. There's great data for that, and that you can bill initial and subsequent. 